Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barack of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. So we've had him on a number of times. He's kind of our China expert, uh, considering he has the boots on the ground there and he's lived there for quite a while. Uh, it's Dan Collins of the China Money Report. Um, thank you for joining us again on a Wall Street for Main Street podcast, Dan Collins. Thanks, Jason. It's good to be back. Now, um, Dan, for for listeners who are not familiar with you, uh, talk about your background a little bit and uh, how you ended up in China and uh, what you do in China now. Okay. Well, uh, I've lived in China 15 years. Uh, I moved to China about 23, 24 years old, right right out of school. Did my undergraduate out of Michigan State. So it was kind of a, uh, you know, my background from a younger age was coming out of the state of Michigan, which had been in a 30-year depression as the automobile industry, which is basically what the main industry in Michigan is, as that collapsed through the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, I saw all that growing up. And I wanted to do international business, so I uh, signed up for an exchange program. I was one of the first exchange students from, uh, at Tsinghua University in Beijing, which is kind of the MIT of China. And uh, my background's originally engineering. And I worked in China uh, first seven years with General Motors. So I went there when uh, Shanghai General Motors was just starting, and uh, we sold 10,000 cars there the first year. And by the time I'd left, they had sold two million cars a year. Seven, eight years later, today they sell more than uh, cars in China than they do the United States. So I really witnessed, you know, living in China from 1998 until today. I really witnessed probably the greatest industrial revolution the world has ever seen or will ever see we'll grow, watching China grow from poor backward country where uh, people could barely afford a bicycle to today where if you don't have a BMW or a Mercedes, you're really looked down upon <laughs> in the major cities in China. Of course, outside it can be quite different, but uh, though that was my background. Uh, I was originally engineering. Uh, I had started my own firm doing some real estate investments. Uh, then I started uh, three years ago, Tiger Hill Capital. It's a Hong Kong company doing uh, private equity. And uh, I also started the China Money Report, which is a website where I try to um, categorize a lot of the news on ec economic news on China from, from an insider's perspective. And that's been going about two years now, and that's been pretty successful. We went over 100,000 unique visitors a few months ago. Uh, so really trying to continue that. I'm uh, now looking, trying to invest outside of China, other areas, uh, Mongolia, Cambodia, uh, and in the United States. It's very interesting, and you you also ran an auto parts company for a while too, right? In China. Yeah, after I was with General, after I left General Motors, I started to work with uh, uh, some Taiwanese industrial companies in China. I ran a, a large Taiwanese Chinese industrial company, had a thousand people uh, in the company. I was the CEO, and that was before I started my firm in Hong Kong. Very good. And um, now, now let's talk about the the Chinese economy real quick. Now, uh, well, let's go in depth, not just real quick. Um, we uh, we've seen here in the West that 60 Minutes documentary, and everyone talk, everyone in the mainstream financial media talks about that, the ghost cities and things like that. But doing more due diligence online, I saw some documentarians uh, investigate, check whether or not the mainstream media was lying, and I saw some American and Canadian documentary people go to these, some of these supposed ghost cities in China, and you know, 18 months, two years later, after they're supposedly empty, there's a lot of people there, and the shops are built out, and you know, restaurants and things that were shown as empty in the documentary, there's people in there. So um, what, what's your opinion on the mainstream media's coverage of China? Well, as usual, they, they don't understand China, and they've totally got the wrong story. It's, it's really a non-story. I've been saying that for years. I've lived in so-called ghost cities. Uh, I lived in a west, uh, far eastern side of Suzhou called the Suzhou Industrial Park. What people don't, in the West don't get is that because the economy here has become so perverted and pricing, so you know, misalloc you know, malinvestments here and really – you know, we've lost 65,000 factories in the United States last 10 plus years. Uh, when I go around the U.S., there'll be 
they'll be fixing the same small patch of a road for a year. The Chinese do that in about 18 hours. So what happens with the ghost cities is uh, there'll be a new investment area of the city, and that side of the city will get built up in six months. New schools, new factories, new hospitals, roads. I mean, it just gets done. And then it looks empty because it just got a built in six months. But as you mentioned, if you wait a year and a half, two years later, it fills up because everything's bought and, and, and paid for with equity. It's not all debt. So there are some areas like Ordos is a good example where some local governments get way too uh, over ambitious and overbuild. But on general, 80 to 90 percent of these so-called ghost cities are not ghost cities and they'll be filled up. They're really redevelopment uh, areas of cities with, that are urbanizing because China China has been rapidly urbanizing for the last 10 plus years. That's, that's very good points, and um, I've seen in other documentaries where, you know, they're building a whole brand new city next to an old city, and the old city, you know, didn't have good sewer systems, the roads weren't big enough for modern day cars and trucks and things like that, it didn't have public transportation, so it looks to me that the people are just going to, I guess, leave the older cities and just go to the new cities, is that what you, uh, we've seen in China? Exactly what's happening, so like what you just said, Suzhou, there was the old Suzhou, it had a million people. Uh, about 20 years ago today, it has 20 million people. Oh, not 20 million, it's about 15 million if you count the whole surrounding area. So if you look at that as an example, they had old Suzhou, which was very small, could only you know, only fit a million people, I guess small by China standards. And then the government says, okay, we're going to redevelop this whole east side of the area surrounding countryside. They And then they put out the bids and they say, we're going to build roads here, here, here. Bids go in for hospitals, schools, and all, this is all private enterprise, all these companies get the license to build what they want to do. It goes into a master development plan. And then uh, the government moves their offices over there, and then people move into the new new part of town, uh, which is much nicer than the old part of town, as, as you just described very well, which is, you know, congested roads are too small and poor sewer treatment, things like that. So, yeah, absolutely, that's what's been going on. The whole ghost cities, you know, America doesn't want to believe that anybody's getting it better than them. So it's kind of a natural attack on China, These this whole ghost city story. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. But, I, I mean, like, like you also said earlier, you talked about misallocation of capital. So it's not all uh, rainbows and unicorns in China. I mean, they are misallocating massive amounts of capital, too. That, they're building they, – they, there's um, – there's just a lot of projects and a lot of crony capitalism, too. I mean, there's uh, – here in the D.C. metro area, there's a lot of Chinese people who come in here with all cash and buy up real estate and things like that. And I've heard similar stories from my real estate contacts in California and Florida and Arizona and similar stories about Canada and stuff like that, too. People, you know, who got uh, government money from a contract or who borrowed from the shadow banking system and, you know, didn't – invest the money how they were, they were supposed to. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And China is, you know, the king of crony, crony capitalism. The only difference is in China, you actually have to do something to get the money. Like you have to build something or you have to produce something. Whereas in the United States, you just have to manipulate numbers on a spreadsheet to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's full of crony capitalism. There's definitely malinvestment, especially if you look at the steel sectors, the renewable energy sector. Basically, anywhere where the government gets involved is where the malinvestment happens in China. You know, when I moved there in 98, the government threw their hands up. I mean, you have to go back in the 60s, China's starving to death, right? 50 million people, people starved to death under their central planning. Finally, by 78, they kind of threw their hands up and said, we, you know, Deng Xiaoping's favorite quote everyone likes to reference is, you know, I don't care what color the mice, mouse is as long as it catches rats, you know. So they went to basically... And to be rich is glorious, too. Exactly, right. right. So they went to total laissez-faire capitalism and, like, literally said universities, you want money, go start businesses. They told the military, you want money, go start businesses. Military started opening hotels all over the country. So it was basically just laissez-faire capitalism. That's what built the country. And then by the early 2000s, they really started getting overconfident in themselves and, like, all governments believing that they did that. They built that, not the hardworking Chinese Business people and entrepreneurs and, and, and workers built that. So then they started, you know, then you get in these malinvestment projects where every little city wants their own steel plant and every little city wants their own soccer house. stadium. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the list goes on and on. And now we're kind of waking up from the, the headache of that. There's a massive anti corruption drive has been going on for a couple of years the, from the premier Xi of China. 
Uh, I mean, they're just netting all kinds of people. And, uh, of course, they're netting his political enemies. I mean, every, there's going to be a lot of people that won't get caught that are still in good favor in the po political system. But, yeah, it's a, it's a totally corrupt system from top down, really. And anyone in China will tell you that, even Chinese. <laughs> But um, don't they have uh, – would you say it's easier then for an entrepreneur to start a business in China or in the U.S., or does it depend on the industry in the U.S.? Because, you know, for an online entrepreneur here in the U.S., you know, you could start a website and be up and running fairly quickly with an e-commerce business. But for other uh, types of businesses here in the U.S., you need a humongous amount of permitting, rules, regulations, fees. You're looking at, you know, 40K, 100K in the hole, and many years of permits and things like that. Uh, are those the same rules in China? And China has all its own rules. It's, 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 I would say it's probably easier than the United States to get things done, much, much easier in terms of real economy businesses. You know, there's, there's, you know each department has its office, so the environment, you know, and you just go down to the office, uh, and they come in, and, and, and they'll help you and show you the steps. Um, and a lot of times you can get done everything permitted and done at one local government office, and, wow. including, your, you know, getting your electric on, your water on, and all that stuff. So, um, but uh, I would say in general, the uh, real economy, it's easier to get things done. The problem with the U.S. is it, 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 the market's not there anymore. <laughs> it's like, it's, uh, you know, they make, we make like 7 million cars in the United States. 10 years ago, we made 13 million. China, 10 years ago, as I mentioned, made 1 million. Now they make 20 million. So the market in the, you know, the markets in China, the whole global economic center of gravity is changing to Asia Pacific with China at its core. Well, the, the U.S. shouldn't be making that many cars, uh, Dan, because I, I don't think the U.S. economy is growing at this point. And also, if you look at the statistics of the people who are buying the cars right now in the U.S., it's almost all subprime auto loans. People are not putting any money down. People are barely living paycheck to paycheck, or they're getting a humongous amount of money from the government. Those people don't have the capital to be able to buy a car. I mean, right. most people are barely able to make the payment. So it makes sense. That um I I I don't know um are people in China using a lot of mortgage uh, a lot of debt to buy cars and consume and things like that? No, ninety five percent of car loans and sorry ninety five percent of cars purchased in China are paid with cash, cash up front. Now the reason why Americans can't buy cars at the, or they're buying car cars more than they can afford is that they don't buy locally produced cars. So Japan ninety five percent of cars in Japan are made in Japan. Ninety five percent of cars are made. In China are made in China. 95% of cars in Korea are made in Korea. The same with Germany. It's probably 85% there. And in the United States, it's less than 50%. I mean, a country with the United States, all that labor, all that raw material, and we can't produce half of the cars that we buy. And that's why we don't have jobs. Uh, we have sent off all of our factories and all of our manufacturing offshore. And a lot of that's due to the highest tax rate in the world. A lot of that's due to permitting and, and, and th you know, in the EPA type stuff, but, you know, most of it's to do with tax rate. If you go off, you know, most of these global Fortune 500s don't pay taxes. You know, everything's in BVI, Ireland, Holland to avoid the taxes. You've seen that as a big story with the inversion. Now, last of the American companies are figuring out and, and doing merger and acquisition to go offshore. So, um, yeah, until we get our manufacturing jobs back, we're not going to have a real economy. So you have to be able to produce some good size portion of what you consume right now we just consume 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 all based off printed money and we have no real economy yeah i mean consuming you can consume before you produce maybe a little bit run up the credit card a little bit but eventually you have to grow your income or produce something in order to pay off the debt and or develop some savings or capital in order to grow uh grow your economy and you know uh have savings to invest to start a business or whatever else, travel or whatever else you want to do. Otherwise, you're going to be working paycheck to paycheck your whole life, paying off debt. And unfortunately, that's how most American consumers are. Um, I, I want to talk about the Chinese consumer, though. Um, you, you mentioned demand, some of the demand for autos. Um, are we seeing demand also in uh, other types of consumer sectors in China? Is there still solid demand growth in other uh, sectors? Yeah, absolutely. China is the number one market in the world for online commerce. You probably heard of this Alibaba IPO coming out. That's all online com commerce. They own the Taobao platform, which is kind of like the Amazon of China. It's number one. It's the number one market now in wines. It's the biggest online consumer, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, mall, the, the retail and shopping infrastructure is just get really getting, getting put in place. But 
per capita, China's leading uh, the United States in online purchases. So, I mean, they're buy I mean, it's a massive consumer market. China's the world's second largest importer behind the United States. So it's a huge consumer market. People in the U.S. don't often see it that way because everything they go to buy is made in China. But it doesn't mean that they're only producing. They're also consuming. Yeah, that, that makes sense that, that they would also start to consume because – I mean, um, one of the things that a lot of people who are anti-China don't understand is, you know, they talk about slave labor in the factories and things like that, but they don't understand when you compare the amount of money that a, a farm worker in China was making to when they go to the factories, it's a humongous increase. Oh, absolutely, and yeah. It, Chinese farm workers now are making – it's not un, un, unheard of for Chinese farm workers to make $800 a month now. Well, well, I mean, I mean, going from the farm to the factory is a humongous salary increase, and then on top of that, the, yes, Chinese workers are paid a low amount of money relative to the United States, but they started at such a low base. But what over since you've been in China, I'm sure the wages for factory workers have gone up a lot. I, they've gone up many hundreds of percent. Oh yeah, six, seven hundred percent since I came here. Yeah. Yeah, and and if. Uh, a Chinese worker smartly, you know, lived below their means and saved up their money, they would have some savings to consume or invest or start a business or things like that. And absolutely, and, and that's the key. That, and they get jobs and they learn how to do stuff and they learn how to make stuff, then they start their own company. And that's really the whole foundation of capitalism. That's why China's been so successful is there's so many guys here that can read a blueprint and, and build a plant or start a little screw machine shop or – just do all kinds of stuff, and um, you know, that's been the upward spiral of China since 1978 when they opened it up. Yeah, I think from a historical standpoint, Dan, what most people don't understand about China, and I took a Chinese history course in college, and I, I like learning about it. I also watch a lot of Chinese movies inside titles about the war battles and things like that. I think it's their culture is very interesting. Um, Except for the um, Chairman Mao period of communism, and that's really the, the rarity in, in the long length of Chinese history, the Chinese have been very entrepreneurial. They've invented a lot of things. They've brought a lot of uh, products and services that have spread all across the globe that uh, most people you know, are not that familiar with. Sure, absolutely. Capitalism is the natural state of man all over the world. You know, What's not natural are all these ideological systems we put on top of capitalism. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean China invented products that people wouldn't expect came from China, I believe, like fireworks and ice cream and you know so many other things. Mm -hmm. And people didn't think uh, – pasta too. I mean noodles came first from China, and then Marco Polo brought them back to Italy, right? So yep. there's a – now um, let, since, since I brought up pasta and food, let's talk about uh, inflation in China. Um, the U.S. has pretty decent inflation right now. According to John Williams of Shadow Statistics, it's, it's around 8%. Um, it's pretty high, but um, you know I've heard we, – we've had some listeners to this podcast comment about inflation in China, and it's much higher in China. Uh, what's your opinion, boots on the ground, of uh, the inflation in China right oh, now? Oh, yeah. China uh, – inflation in China is horrific. I mean inflation globally is horrific, including the United States. As you mentioned, uh, John Williams' numbers, I also follow him. You know, I, as an outsider, originally from the States, I come back and I think, are people nuts? They think it's only 1% inflation? I mean, health care, education, the price of gas is up, the barrel of oil is up 300% in about 10 years. Where is this 1% inflation? I mean, they have, there's some product, China has kept manufacturing products cheap by shipping them over U.S., but everything else that an American touches has skyrocketed in the last 10, 15 years. And it's only getting worse. Now we're getting you know, finally some numbers here, I think 2% inflation. But in China, we've seen, oh my goodness, I mean, everything in China is now more expensive than the United States. Uh, vegetable prices have gone up in some, for some certain types of vegetables 30 times in 10 years. Um, you know, you, you can't touch, you can't find anything. And, you know, price of cars are 30% more than the United States. Homes, you know, you're looking at for a small Three bedroom apartment in Shanghai, you're looking at seven hundred thousand easy. Uh, I mean, it's just you know, and ten years ago that would have been a hundred thousand dollars. So I mean, the inf inf you know, inflation is just everywhere across China. It's uh, it's a big problem, and that's one of the reasons why China has engineered a slowdown in the economy these last few years. You know, they uh, there's quotas now, how many cars you can buy. They don't want cars out in the street. They're trying to limit the purchases. Uh, they're trying to they limit the purchase of homes. You can only buy one home. You literally cannot buy two homes now. Uh, so there's all kinds of things China's trying to 
slam down on the brakes of the economy to get that uh, inflation under control. And the Federal Reserve keeps stoking inflation all across the world, world with the printed money. Yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, China had the dollar peg. So when the U.S. did the quantitative easing programs, China had to print two to soak up all those dollars. That they had to print RMB in their lo- uh, to soak up the dollars locally, and that just created massive amounts of inflation. But I think what we've been seeing out of China also is that some large Chinese companies, maybe it's um, backed by the Chinese government, the sovereign wealth funds, you've started to see Chinese companies make acquisitions in the resource sector. You saw a very large purchase of Smithfield Foods in the last couple of years. I think that was probably to make sure that, that China China gets a certain amount of pork uh, delivered back, you know, to deal with the inflation problems and to meet demand for pork. And, um, you know, it just appears like commodities are still, especially food, energy, and precious metals to me. Uh, I don't like base metals because I, I don't think um, the demand for those is going to keep increasing at a rapid rate in China. But it seems food, energy, and precious metals, there's going to be very strong demand for those in China from years to come. Yeah, I agree. Uh, base metals, I'm also pretty bearish on that because there's been so much capacity put in. China's already built 50 new New York cities. Uh, you know, Most of the build-outs there, they'll still continue to be build-out. I don't think you'll see a crash. But you're not going to see the growth in, in base metals and the usage of copper and ore like we have seen in the past. Um, we just, As I mentioned, we just went through the world's largest – industrialization the world's ever seen in the last 15 years in China. And history will, will say that was, you know, that was the time. Um, regarding the pork, as you mentioned, another good point. American companies, their pork company at Smith F- F- Foods, they value it at U.S. pork prices of a dollar something a pound. Well, a Chinese company says, oh, we're going to value that, but it's three dollars a pound because price for pork three times in China than it was in in the U.S., and that's why – So so is a bargain. Then. Absolutely. So in, from a Chinese standpoint, you're going to get a lot of agricultural you know, mergers and acquisitions because the food's cheaper over here. So, Plus they can dump the dollar, all those excess dollars too, right, and buy legitimate companies with them. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What you saw this week – I mean the big news that I've been following these last weeks are the establishment of the BRIC Bank, more funds going into China Development Bank. All of these things are coalescing into what I've been talking about for – three years now, which is the renminbi eventually replacing the dollar as the world reserve currency. And Chinese trade now has been moved from 0% in renminbi to 20% renminbi. That'll be up to 50% renminbi by 2016. All of those trade surpluses are now going to go into BRIC Bank, China Development Bank. You know, China has owned Africa for 10 years, okay? The United States no longer has a real economy. We're not building power plants in Sudan. We're not building bridges in Ethiopia. China's doing that. China's building now, has the shoe factories in Ethiopia. They're doing the bridges, the sports stadiums, the roads, the power infrastructure. Okay, they've done that for Africa for 10 years. Now we just saw this week in Latin America, as our New York vulture funds are going after Argentina for their debt default, trying to get you know, profits in the thousands of percent on their bonds instead of just taking the loss like an investor should do if if the investment goes bad. They're suing Argentina. Meanwhile, Argentina has walked away from the global capital markets and just got $50 billion from China. Chinese, Chinese development banks funding Argentinian ports, plants, new roads, tram system that will run the length of South America. They just signed huge deals with Brazil. So Africa has gone to the China camp. Latin America has gone to the China camp. And the the last one standing there is the U.S., you know, and what do we build in these countries? Drone bases. We really need to wake up. Those are very interesting. And it seems to me, Dan, like every week there's at least one or two new bilateral trade agreements announced between China and another country. And, you know, it's – whether it's a, the world's largest oil refinery that the Saudis and China are going to build, and then a pipeline that goes – an oil pipeline that goes to China or natural gas deals with Russia and China or um, bilateral trade agreements with Germany and China. And then uh, recently, Switzerland and China just did a bilateral trade agreement. It seems a lot of Europe and the Middle East are also – uh, getting fed up with the United States' policy here of quantitative easing and printing money, flooding the world, you know, with cheap dollar, uh, with excess dollars, and it seems that you know the, they're starting to uh, make deals with China instead. Yeah, last one out of the door on the U.S. dollar, turn the lights out because everyone's <laughs> running away. Everyone's running away. 
As you mentioned, the swap agreements have been going on for three years. China's the world's largest creditor, the world's largest trading nation. We have an exact parallel happening today, U.S. and China, that happened to U.S. and Britain. Britain lost its product productive base after World War I. It never recovered. It lagged Germany industrial production. By the time we got to World War II and the war started, all you know, the global center of finance and the switch to the real economy, which was the United States, which was the productive powerhouse of the world. So when productive balances get upset, then the financial center moves to the productive balances. That is the next stage. The financial center of the world will become China. As I mentioned, they're, they're the one with the reserves. They're the ones with the trade surpluses. And the gold, I think, yeah. too. <laughs> they're going to be the ones with the gold. Yeah, that horror story is just waiting. You know, at some point, we're going to find out the Federal Reserve don't have the gold they claimed. So it, it, it's kind of a, you know, this this has been the story for 500 years as productive balances change in the world, relative power changes in the world. Military power will change in the world. I mean, you know, our military companies have be, never had to compete in a competitive marketplace. If we really had to go toe to toe with somebody like China, we would we would lose. I mean, we have the high tech stuff, but if they blast some of our satellites out of the space, we would lose in a, in a war because we couldn't build stuff fast enough to compete with China. Well, I mean, U.S. military companies still outsource a lot of part development stuff to Chinese companies. So it's not like the U.S. military companies are doing the manufacturing themselves. They just try to diversify the parts mix so the Chinese can't piece everything together. That's another, that's another good point. Yeah, I've, I've covered that as well. It's that we're actually de dependent, de completely dependent on China for most of our military hardware. So, you know, whether it's rare earth materials or... Uh, you know, a lot of the fuel, the chemicals that go into the into like the uh, Hellfire missiles, we're 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 totally dependent on them. So I mean, it's kind of a joke where the United States thinks we're going to confront China, we're going to borrow money from China, uh, so we can buy their materials to build weapons to confront them. It, it's really a joke. Now, um, we, we talked about gold very briefly. Let, let's talk about gold because our listeners, uh, you know, under, uh, really are gold bugs. A lot of them, and. What's your opinion of gold demand in China? Uh, has it increased since 2013? Because in 2013, according to Kuz Jansen of Gold We Trust, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, over uh, 2,000, 2,000 tons of physical precious metals were removed from there, which is basically all the world's annual mining, uh, gold mining supply. Uh, do you think demand for physical gold is still strong in China? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've seen some recent numbers that have come out. Gold demand's down 10 or 20%. But in reality, a lot of these numbers, you know, they're hard to track. There are so many stores in mainland that sell gold. You know, gold bars are sold in the banking retail branches. I mean, you can have, I've probably mentioned this on your show before, you can have bank accounts in gold in China. So, I mean, I could go into a Chinese bank account, change my change my money to, in, to be down, dominated in gold. Later that afternoon, I can change it back into renminbi. And, and that's like with no transaction fees, just almost seamless. So well, that has to be paper gold then, if it's no transaction. It's paper fees. gold, and but you can also buy the physical gold from the retail ban banks, and you can store re physical gold in the retail branches. You know, I've been to small, tiny cities, and they have windows of, you know, with bars of small bars of gold, you know, that you can buy and silver. So um, in terms of overall demand, you know, I don't look at it short term. You know, in terms of is it doing well this quarter or not, or this year or not. All I look at it is how much money has been printed in the world. That has to be soaked up into the limited availability of gold and silver, and that's why I continue to weight at average purchase precious metals myself. You know. Now, um, in terms of buying physical precious metals in China, um, there's a lot of counterfeiting. The Chinese are very good at making counterfeits of pretty much everything. So um, uh, how hard is it? to um, make sure that you're buying real physical gold and silver in China? Is, uh, is, is, is there some sort of regulatory thing, or is there a good quality control among a lot of the uh, larger shops in China? Yeah, the, uh, the, gold, is, um, there's, the gold is very uh, regulated and sold through the banks. Um, so the banks are, you know, there's a regulatory system there that has, has all the quality check and all that. And I think, you know, gold's not as easy to uh, copy as people would think because of, the periodic, you know, balance of, of the chemical metallurgy itself. So, you know, it has a certain density on the weight and, you know, and certain chemical structures. So 
Um, yeah, I'm I, I'm not worried about fakes, but that, yeah, I wouldn't be out on a corner market buying gold either. So. Okay, because because on eBay, um, you know, for a test run a, a couple years ago, I bought like about fifty bucks worth of uh, 925 sterling silver necklaces from China. Mm-hmm. You know, it was stamped 925 sterling silver. The weight seems comparable, but then I started filing down through the silver to check, and, you know, it was just really well-made uh, knockoff copper that was coated in silver or some other type. It, yeah, it was, that's I think jewelry and stuff like that. I don't buy it. Stay away from that kind of stuff. You're talking about some little jeweler that can manipulate that stuff. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch anything like that. I only do – I only invest in the bars, really. Okay, well, um, you you have a you, you commented on a Jim Rogers interview with a Chinese reporter on your website calling for the government to strengthen their currency rather than weaken it. Why do you think this needs to happen, and the impact it will have on the manufacturing industry in China? Yeah, I've 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 talked to I've tried to tell Chinese uh, people, high level policymakers that I know this for years, at least three years now. The reason is that they don't understand uh, – they, they're stuck in this mindset that Japan got stuck in, which is export, export, factory, export, factory, export. And what that does is it's – it's what, what they've been doing by holding down the RMB, and they have been holding down the RMB. You can check the current – you know, they go out every day in the world market and uh, buy U.S. dollar and sell RMB. That's how they end up with $4 trillion in reserves. They go out every day to manipulate the currency down to keep it pegged. Well, what happens is it sends mispriced signals throughout the market. It says go build more factories, go export more products. That's why now China is you – know, one of the reasons why China has overinvestment in factories. And you've, you've encouraged the you know, blue-collar factory uh, type of work versus the service sector. So China needs to move into the service sector. When I moved to China, only 5% of people had a university degree. Today it's 35%. You look at rates in Taiwan, 99% have university degrees. Chinese love education. They're very focused on it. China eventually will not be able to find factory workers and all, because everyone's going to have a university degree. Even today, you can't find factory workers. So what China needs to do, you let the RMB come to a natural rate. It's probably going to go up 3 to 1, 2 to 1. Japanese yen went up 700% over 30 years, and they still run trade surpluses with the United States, as mentioned in that Jim Rogers interview. So if they, as they let the renminbi go up, Chinese living standards will go up. They'll be able to import more, uh, and you'll have more of a natural balance of the economy, unlike that you have today. And I think they hold the renminbi down on purpose because a lot of these top government officials have uh, in, have investments in some of these big uh, high capex investment companies like Chinese tires or chemical processing, things like that. So if they let the RMB go up two to one, you know, three to three to one from current six to one, I think this whole Chinese economy will balance out really nicely and let the market decide the, the currency rates, not you know central planners. Exactly, and if the currency strengthens, there'd be bonuses to that too, because then the consumers would have more purchasing power, and it would be an incentive to save more. Uh, save more and invest more and things and capital more capital investment capital would flow into the country too so it would be like a, a positive feedback loop if they let the currency strengthen but I guess all these Chinese central planners they all went to uh, the London School of Economics or they went to you know Ivy League American schools and they were taught bullshit Keynesian economics you know mercantilism that you know we have to we have to manipulate our monetary policy, play games with our currency, weaken it so we can gain a trade advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And you just mentioned the key word, mercantilism, and that's what Japan and Korea have been doing in the United States for 40 years. China's been doing it, and the uh, U.S. needs to wake up and put trade barriers on these guys. Well, I, I mean, mercantilism is Keynesianism. Keynesianism is – Keynes didn't invent really anything new. He just borrowed a lot of stuff from John Law and other people. He, he really did not – he really did not um, – he actually skipped 150 years or so of economic thought prior to him you know, writing the general theory. He went back 150 years and went back to mercantilism when he wrote the general theory and pieced you know, other people's work together. But um, it's just funny, though, that you know, the Chinese, Chinese Keynesians, they're just executing the plan, I guess, uh, very efficiently. <laughs> the Japanese did it too, and the J- Japan stuck in a disaster. Now Japan is actually starting to run trade deficits now. Because you know they don't have natural resources and their input prices for food and energy are going through the roof and it's killing their manufacturers. 
and their consumers. So it's 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 the Keynesian endgame here, and you know, hopefully China wakes up and figures out that you know they have to let their currency strengthen, and um, you know, the free market will start to take care of itself like that. No doubt about it. Yeah. Now, um, in, in terms of the pollution in China, do you, do you think? Um, figuring out how to invest in in China solving its uh, air and water pollution problems is one of the best investable themes in China. Uh, it, it, it is, but like all investable themes, it, you have to be careful. Uh, you know, a lot of people sell stories based on China Plus investable theme, like uh, we saw with the Sinil Forest, where John Paulson lost five billion dollar. The company actually didn't own any parts of forest; they said they did, but. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, China's going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on environmental cleanup. It's already on, in, in process. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just that's probably the, one of the biggest growth areas in China. They're now, when the pollution is absolutely horrid. I mean, people can't, if you've never been here and, and experienced it, you can't imagine. It's. Uh, Google the pictures. Take a look at yeah. the, it's the asthma problems. Yeah. And is there's days, right, when people can't go out? Oh yeah, there's absolutely there's days now where people they'll say stay inside, and that and that goes back to when you import the entire world's manufacturing capacity into your country. That's what's going to happen. And also use coal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and use coal for eighty percent of your energy. So, I mean, I trust the Chinese government. We're going to get this. They're going to get this under control, but it's not going to be anytime soon. So I know like Beijing, they're closing down four coal plants that are near Beijing. They're going to move them way, you know. 100 miles, 200 miles outside of Beijing. So, but we'll see if, uh, you know, we'll see how quickly they can get a hold on this. I think if anything threatens civil unrest in China, it's number one pollution and it's number two corruption by the central party. Those are the two things that could bring the government down if they're not careful. Now, um, is, is there any investable themes you like, like consumer demand for luxury brands or um, food, energy, precious metals like we discussed, or an, any other types of big themed Chinese trends that are, you know, regardless of inflation, deflation, the global economy slowing down, that um, are going to be fairly well insulated in terms of an investing theme uh, based on China? Yeah, absolutely. So just from a, a macro standpoint, something I'm putting together now, which people don't realize, is a, there's getting a lot of press now. This is the year, or maybe next year, China's GDP passes the United States on a PPV on a purchase priority basis. What they're not hold, what they're not taking into account though is if you if you just from a macro standpoint here, if you take Chinese growth rates out, continuing at seven percent, and U.S. growth rates at two percent, only by in 2030, the numbers I've been putting together, 2030, China's GDP could be two to three times larger than the United States. So let's forget about, oh, they're going to pass the United States. We have to invest for the time when China is going to be two to three times larger than the United States in GDP. Two times based on current exchange rate. If it goes up to about from six to one to about four to one or three to one, it's going to be a $60 trillion, uh, $30, $40 trillion GDP annually. So two to three times the United States. So that's the time what we need to invest for now. What you what China's transforming into? It's transforming in from a manufacturing export economy into retail, financial services, uh, tourism, any kind of these themes. The Chinese stock market, Hong Kong markets are as well have been depressed for a long time on this China's going to collapse theme, which just not not happening. I also think the markets are – sorry to interrupt you, Dan, but I also think the stock markets in uh, Beijing and Hong Kong are depressed due to the accounting problems that they have. They really need to fix those. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of the accounting problems that are so well known in the in the West, those guys went to the West to list the stock because they knew they couldn't get away with it in China. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, I, that, that, that's well, where they, all the reverse mer, you know, verse, uh, uh, listings happen in the States. You know, they, in China, there's no way you get away with that. you got to be a real company with real earnings, real assets. Okay, because I listened to a podcast from a lady in China. It was like China Business News or one of the um, government-sponsored news things, and they were talking about why Chinese people won't buy stocks. And the lady said, because Chinese people don't trust Chinese company accounting either, regardless of their standards. So maybe the Chinese companies have to start paying di more dividends or things like that yeah, but, because the Chinese people don't uh, don't trust their own accounting standards. Th either. There's some of that. There is some of that, and then there's also the point here is that it's really an insider's game here. I mean, it's like. Everything's entire trading, so you know Chinese. So, so it's like it's like it re really is like the U.S. then in the early 1900s. <laughs> yeah, or worse. I mean, it's all it's all insider trading, and people don't like get ripped off, so they don't put their money in the stock market. 
They like very safe, conservative investments, i.e. housing. That's why they go to housing. That's why they go to precious metals. Um, that's why they're buying houses in the States now to diversify. But back to the crony capitalism thing, they're also diversifying their wealth because nobody's got clean hands here. So at some point, they could come under investigation. So they want to get some assets out of the country. Um, so, But yeah, I mean, the stock market hasn't taken off uh, mainstream yet. When it does watch out i mean we could you know it could be up as i mentioned just look at the macro gdp you're going to go up from a nine trillion dollar gdp to a 40 trillion dollar gdp within 15 years so there's gonna be a lot of retail stocks you know uh, tourism as i mentioned financial services all of these are just starting to grow and, and blossom in china um you know online e-commerce these kinds of things are the macro trends that you know and you play the renminbi so you know, anyone, young people out there want to get started, you know, China's going to be the place to be for the next 15 years. And then after that, we have to see what happens because the demographics are going to turn very negative for China. But we'll see what happens. Yeah, in, in terms of the great companies, you know, you mentioned earlier in the interview Alibaba, and then there's Baidu, Sohu. Uh, there's also C Trip and companies like that, but I, I don't like the valuations on those companies right now because you know Wall Street knows that those are the great companies. But if there was a humongous global market crash again, I think those would be good companies to start buying um, in a panic, like a 2008 event where everyone throws the baby out with the bathwater. I think those would be good investments. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yep. Now, um, my final question for you, and you touched on this with young people. Uh, this is Mo's question. Uh, he sent me it. He couldn't be here, unfortunately. Uh, he had another uh, he had another uh, ar arrangement to do. He had something else. But uh, if young Americans are entrepreneurs, and we have a we have a good amount of people in college or entrepreneurs who listen to this podcast, want to move to China and start a career there, or maybe expand their online business to the Chinese consumer, uh, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I would say uh, for, get first of all, you got to get over to China. So get your visa, get a student visa. I know a lot of young people in China. They go over to teach English to get started make contacts. I know a lot of successful people, I mean, that have, they started just American restaurant, okay, like, uh, you know, burgers and fries. And then four years later, they own 10 restaurants. Um, I mean, this is, it's happened time and time again. And lots, I know lots of foreigners in China with businesses that have become very successful. Guys that didn't even go to college, like I said, the one guy at the restaurant, he's from Wyoming, he just came over and now he's with restaurant mogul, you know what I mean? You know, relatively speaking, you know, 10 restaurants or so. But um, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, opportunities in China, uh, you know, working for Chinese companies, um, you know, but you got to get over there and get and get the boots on the ground and the lay of the land. And some people like it, some people don't. Um, but that's there's that's where the real opportunity is nowadays. And and there's a lot of Chinese who all speak English or um, is it going to be difficult to learn Mandarin and Cant? Uh, is it going to be difficult to move around there without Mandarin and Cantonese? Uh, no, in the major cities, you go to the major cities. Most young people speak English. Um, you know, you definitely should learn the language. I speak fluent Mandarin Chinese. Um, I, you know, when I was an exchange student, so I had a, a kind of a base there to, to learn it with. But um, you know, if I was just getting out of university today, I'd probably redo exactly what I did. I'd sign up for a Chinese language. A course it was about three months, it's intensive Mandarin for three months. Get over there at the university. Try to get towards a major city, you know, get towards Chongqing, Shanghai, Beijing, um, you know, or slightly outside of it. You don't want to be in the middle of you know the nowhere. So you can have a totally different experience, China experience, depending on where you end up. Same thing as in the United States. If you went to New York City to learn English, or if you ended up in uh, Appalachia to learn English, you're gonna have a totally different concept of the United States. So, um, you know, pick your pick, pick the areas you want to go and, uh, you know, do the best you can with the language. It's not easy. I'll tell you flat out to do the language. Very few people end up really speaking fluently. Um, but uh, there's I know a lot of successful people in China that have, have done it. Very good. Now, I just want to thank you again for your time, Dan. You spent a lot of time, and uh, due to the hour differential, you're up qu pretty early right here speaking to us. So um, thank you again for your time, Dan, and uh, please tell our listeners uh, where they can follow your work. Uh, yeah, you can follow me at thechinamoneyreport.com.
Okay, great. Well, um, we'll have you back on in a couple months to talk more about China. Uh, I like getting updates from you since your boots are on the ground there. Uh, you're not like one of these Wall Street analysts that, you know, doesn't go over to China at all or maybe stays at a nice hotel in Beijing or Shanghai for three days and thinks they know everything. So it's <laughs> – I've seen those guys before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of them, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. uh, well, um, thanks again for your time, Dan. Uh, take okay, care. Okay, thanks, Jason. Take care. Bye.